being pummeled by the strong dollar and economists are saying the power crisis is fueling negative investor sentiment. Waking up in the dark has actually become a bit of a norm. It's quite a nice surprise, actually. I was driving home yesterday and I saw the traffic lights were working. I forgot how they worked. Uh, we continuously see the disheartening effects of the power cuts on all of us. Hi, Arapiwa. You're taking a look at the RAND, which has had some really dramatic falls today in the territory of lowest levels ever, ever against the US dollar, even the British pound. Can I agree with me, Dan Bueno? Well, if you've just joined us, the repo rate has been hiked by 50 basis points. But just as that was happening, the rand was taking a pounding. Question: Can President Biden convince African leaders that America is a better partner than China? Let's get to the bottom line. Obviously, the war in Iraq is a big, fat mistake. All right. Now you can take it any way you want, and it took Jeb. It took Jeb Bush, if you remember, at the beginning of his announcement, when he announced the president, it took him five days. He went back. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. It took him five days before his people told him what to say. And he ultimately said it was a mistake. The war in Iraq, we spent $2 trillion, thousands of lives. We don't even have it. Iran is taking over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. Obviously, it was a mistake. So So what we have suffered here, which is a direct demonstration of the manifestation of this Wolfitz doctrine, is for us to be told that uh, we either told this line or otherwise we are on the other side. If you remember, it's not only Wolfitz. I mean, even uh, Bush put it explicitly, you are with us or against us, and characterize the world in between. In just three months in 2020, the value of the rent to the dollar went from 14 rent to an all-time high of 18 rent 64 cents. The past months now, it's almost bound to reach as high as 20 rent to get a mere one dollar. The month before COVID headlines, it only took you 14 rent to get a dollar. The price of bread has literally reached as high as 20 rent for a single loaf. There are dozens of internal and external factors that are causing our economy to reach no man's land, or should I say, causing it to reach levels we have never reached before. Load shedding, the ANC looting money, unemployment rates, the ANC looting money, no signs of our problems being fixed anytime soon, and of course, the ANC looting more money. But the most important reasons why our economy is collapsing is our country, South Africa, choosing to stay neutral and refusing to side with the United States against Russia and China. No, 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 no. You can't disobey the almighty United States and UK government. All sides of these disputes have their flaws. From my personal opinion, I believe it's best when we as a country make moves that best serve the improvement of our internal interests and also Africa's interests as a whole. But there is so much information I found that shows that these global superpowers will never allow our country to truly stay neutral, and apparently, it's actually our fault. Let's start off with the United States of America. One thing about the United States is they have the most disrespectful and most entitled politicians in the world of politics. For an ambassador to go public and disregard the well-being of millions of people, people he sees every single day this We are confident that weapons were loaded onto that vessel, and I would bet my life on the accuracy of that assertion. Here I am enjoying Mnige, and I see this guy making a statement just so other countries can sanction our country and put the masses into a deeper hole of poverty. Or was the goal to lead the public to strike against the government? so we can be liberated by the almighty United States of America. The scary thing about global politics and things happening around the world is the fact that most of us never cared about all these things, but they actually have a direct impact on our lives and the things that may happen on a daily basis. Employment rates, gas prices are skyrocketing, food is becoming even more expensive at an even faster rate than ever before. So look, my fellow youngins, this video today is a journey of understanding for both me and some of you. I've been conflicted as to how I must structure this video, but I want to do my very best to explain things in a way that any of us can understand all the information I found during my research on this matter of the BRICS and the state of our economy. Let's open the USD ZAR foreign exchange chart because this is the fastest way to trace the history of how our currency has been performing against the US dollar. 
USDR basically means how many rands it will take for you to buy one US dollar and vice versa. Meaning how many rands you will get in exchange if you have a single dollar to exchange or sell. When I opened the US dollar South African rand chart, I noticed something quite fascinating and scary at the same time. Since as far as 2001, the South African rand managed to maintain below 13 rands to its value against the US dollar. It was in 2016 when a lot of chaos was happening globally, when Trump came to power and our local government's dirty laundry started to air out massively, that the value of the dollar rose as high as 16 rands. This was considered a crisis for our economy at the time, but they managed to stabilize the currency and so it went back down. But of course, in 2020, we were hit by the virus. And if you remember properly, there were a lot of rumors of there being a variant coming out of South Africa and spreading to their beautiful countries. So they added South Africa to their hardcore ban list and they started keeping all the vaccines to themselves. And big pharmaceutical companies also sold these vaccines at quite a hefty price. So our economy took the hardest hit it has ever taken before. This is why you see the value of the dollar skyrocketing to 18 rand 60 cents in a matter of just three months in 2020. Yes, in just three months, the value of the rand to the US dollar went from 14 rands to 18 rand 64 cents. Did these Western nations, especially the EU, care about African nations going through this crisis? Did they care about spreading news of a new variant being born in South Africa, putting our economy in the jaws of greedy plutocrats and those super rich individuals who gain from the collapse of our economy? Well, my friends, things have become extremely worse. And do you know why things are the worst for our country right now? Because the country made a decision years ago to become trade partners with China and Russia when we needed support and partners willing to invest heavily in our country. Of course, the ANC still looted the money, but my point here is basically, when crisis hits and Putin starts doing his things, which I honestly don't condone at all, because innocent lives are being lost and even the Russian people are suffering for the actions of the government and the actions of course as well of the Ukrainian government. But my point here is, the majority of these northern nations, basically the G7, want us to side with them when it suits their needs and desires. America always wants nations for their own purpose, never to build the nation or support the people's desires for that specific nation. Russia and Cuba literally helped most of the nations in Southern Africa gain freedom from oppressors during the era of racial segregation. So South Africa chose to stay neutral and then the propaganda machine hit us very hard. Oh my god, I mean, we are being hit very, very hard. If you look at the foreign exchange chart, you will realize the value of our currency is steadily declining all the way to 20 rands when meshed against the US dollar. And looking at things from a distance, this will get even worse unless the new BRICS currency plan is accelerated and put into motion. Our economy is being deliberately crushed on one side by foreign entities, and then on the other side as well, we are in complete chaos with ESCOM hitting us with never-ending rolling blackouts, adding to the collapse of our economy and of course, ANC looting more money. We can't forget that one. Basically, there is just a lot happening here. But let's try to take things one step at a time and see if I can understand this matter properly. First of all, let's get one thing out of the way. Our country wouldn't be in this situation if our government was reliable and a little ambitious to begin with. Since Tabombegi left office, we have been in a downward spiral and things keep getting worse and worse. And these guys just couldn't stop stealing money instead of developing the state-owned entities. Fly SA, ESCOM, Transnet. So let me not pile up all the blame on other nations and forget we are a functioning country and the resources to fix any problems. They could have improved ESCOM decades ago, but this is what happens when you have people with no ambition ruling over us. All these so-called leaders lack ambition. They lack the ambition to see our country become better than it was during the early post-apartheid times. I recently saw a trending release telling us that the ANC Youth League will have 50% of the youth in it. A propaganda plot to gain support for the upcoming elections, honestly. If you wanted the Youth League to be ruled by the youth, why didn't they have only the youth ruling it in the first place? For goodness sake, the thing is called the Youth League to begin with. The fact in this matter can only be one. We are about four generations in and the first and second generation don't want to let go of power. Cyril Ramaphosa was there during the Mandela generation 
Zuma was there during the Mandela generation. Like, we want change in this country. We want a new system for the economy. We want new minds with new and fresh plans to bring something new so we can have hope in our country and see some revival of the economy. How are we going to do that when we have people in power that enjoy the old system and have massive gains from this failing system that was set up decades ago? Most of these money-hungry politicians are the ones who made us vulnerable to the shadow engineering of our collapse as a country. So let's get one thing straight. From my mind, we won't be able to stand against these northern nations if we as Africans don't realize it's time for us to stand united and fix our countries internally and clean out all the nonsense. Judging by this SARS report, you would think we don't need the United States because we only import about 8.2% and export just under 8%. But what you don't understand is, we actually need them after all. Firstly, our state is in a position where we cannot be capable of independence yet. We use so much American-backed things that it would be traumatic if the United States sanctioned our country and the American government-friendly businesses left us. There would be no Apple products, no McDonald's, no KFC. Our world would be literally flipped upside down. So one thing I can credit President Cyril Ramaphosa for is his way of handling the United States while also keeping old allies like Russia and China satisfied as well. Wait, I, I know I know you're about to be pissed, but let me try to explain my view. If we had a short-tempered president, he would most likely give the United States and Europe enough ammunition to impose sanctions on us and completely destroy innocent lives. Don't come to my comment section with a self-centered mindset of us needing a leader who will anger these strong northern nations when our economy is already crippled and our people are already suffering from poverty and other things like people who can't afford school fees. So before you speak all that nonsense, first fix the country from the inside and make us independent of all these nations before giving them a reason to paralyze our growth potential. China is the best case study for any upcoming economy or any developing nation. China didn't rattle any feathers when they were building their economy and building their global influence. China focused on building themselves to a point where, after all those sanctions the United States kept placing on them, their economy is still looking to overtake the United States at this rate if things keep going the way they are going right now. Basically, my point here is, don't be biased when judging these things. Realize first that fighting these nations all out at this moment or being involved in their conflicts can cripple us. We need to build our nation from the inside first and make these nations dependent on us to some extent and then we can say no and impose our own will when it comes to these matters. Saudi Arabia at first became a great friend of the United States, making sure their oil was sold using the US dollar, gaining great power over the years and waiting patiently for an opportunity in the form of China's rise to arrive. When China rose to power, that is when now Saudi Arabia doesn't even care about all the threats made by President Biden. Saudi oil is very important to the United States, so the US can't keep pushing them towards China. Look at what is happening now. We all know that the US dollar strength comes from these resources, namely oil, and having most of the gold reserves after the world wars, namely World War I and World War II. Saudi Arabia is coming to the next BRICS meeting, and this has the United States and its allies shaking in their boots because they want to maintain their global dominance and keep the system as it is. Basically, the US and UK dictate the flow, and every nation follows with no questions asked. If this new BRICS currency idea is backed by Saudi and Venezuela oil and Iran oil, it can be very lethal to the United States because there's also rumors of Iran being interested in this BRICS initiative as well. What makes Saudi Arabia different from its predecessor is its timing and intelligence. They played a game of politics and they seemed to be actually winning. Gaddafi tried things prematurely and he failed because he had no great power to truly back him. The Soviets were completely crushed by the United States and China was still on the low end of things. So Gaddafi fumbled the plans to have a single currency for the entire continent of Africa. Also, Fidel Castro as well couldn't do much with Cuba because they were not strategic. South Africa at this point is heavily reliant on all these nations on both sides. We need the G7s for our exports, imports, and the businesses that are trading in our country. But we also need Russia, India, and China because they are our allies, supporting us directly. So you see why our country needed a level-headed person in charge to balance these shadow wars between China, Russia, and the United States. So in this regard, Ramaphosa is actually doing a fairly honestly good job because we haven't been sanctioned by the United States and all those other European nations, since it seems like that's the only other alternative they're giving us for being part of BRICS. 
remember Africa is resources, so these Western nations want to tame African nations and keep us away from China. But South Africa is one of the most influential African countries, if not the most influential. So it's easy, take down South Africa, scare the rest of Africa. That's basically the mentality some of these nations have been adopting. Getting back to our global trade, we are still heavily reliant on all those nations, but the beautiful thing is these days, China seems to have an alternative for everything produced by the United States. But there is one big hidden problem we tend to forget about China. A very big problem at that. The Chinese government is very strict. They are a very strict regime that limits people's rights and people's freedoms. Well, according to Western media. Recently, a comedian was fined about $2 million by the CCP for making a joke that seemed to be a joke about the army. And when you look at WeChat, the Chinese government doesn't just spy on you like, of course, like the United States government does, but the Chinese government will act on anything wrong you do on those social media platforms. They even developed a social merit system as well for the public, which is very scary. These are very scary things, honestly. China led by the CCP is quite scary. They may excel in growth and all that, but at what cost to your freedom if China becomes the main global power in the world? Is all this stuff we hear about China all propaganda? I guess we'll never truly know until we hear from people who live in China or people who have lived in China. The scary image that the US media has painted for us is that China will take away our freedom if they come to power. China will limit our freedom to express our beliefs and faith in public. What I want to know is how much of that is actually the truth. Hopefully you people who stayed in China can educate us regarding these matters and tell us how the Chinese society under the CCP is because propaganda is quite a scary machine in the world. You can't really tell what is true and what is false. For the sake of people on the lower levels of the wealth pyramid, please be careful with your foreign policy. Never make decisions that will lead the majority of citizens going into deeper levels of poverty and suffering. If it means we have to stay neutral, then that's exactly what we have to do. We also have to make sure these nations understand that we won't compromise our trade partners because our economy is in a desperate situation and we desperately need partners who are motivated to help us. Just like what Ramaphosa actually did when he went that side. But the problem with Ramaphosa is they are out there talking a big game while no one is doing anything productive to fix this load sharing problem in our country. In my mind, foreign policy is important, but also our internal affairs should come first. How will we gain independence from these bullies if we don't fix the country and actually build our economy to match our global influence? The state of our economy is slowly no longer matching the amount of influence our country actually has in global politics. Diehard anti-American leaders never end well when they do things unplanned and without proper timing. Some of you might not know this, but Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. But aren't they one of the poorest countries in the world as well? Guess why? they pissed off the United States and all hell ran loose on them. Hugo Chavez made the same mistake that was made by Iraq, giving the United States a reason to invade or to sanction your country and put a hold on any possibility of growth or recovery in the near term. Gaddafi made the exact same mistake as well, wanting to sell oil using gold instead of the United States dollar. These are things that will unleash the propaganda machine all over your nation and the nation will instantly be branded a threat to world peace. So believe me when I say, even us as South Africa can quickly become an enemy to world peace if an aggressive leader comes to power. While going through all this information, I am really trying my best to stay unbiased as possible. I really don't want to paint neither China nor the United States as saints or the complete bad guy. I am highlighting both their flaws to show you that we have fallen to such a weak state as African nations that we really need these countries. We are dependent on them that at times we really get bullied and pushed around by all these countries. It's just a double-edged sword whether you go with China or the United States. It's just a double-edged sword that makes me strongly believe that we must maintain a neutral stance with the North and us South and continents, namely South America and Africa, should build each other or help each other stabilize and gain independence from the imperialist nations of the north. These nations always want world dominance, and once Africa unites, we won't be free from these nations. Xi Jinping announced during the 14th BRICS summit held virtually in late, in late June 2022 that Iran and Argentina submitted applications to join BRICS. We also know Saudi Arabia also wants to join. Now imagine having three of the world's oil powerhouses joining BRICS. That would be a very little blow to NATO expansion and what the United States actually desires. At this point, NATO will push away the entirety of Africa and South America. This geopolitical competition is probably what is making Africa relevant. Nobody in the North cared about us except when they wanted to gain some resources. Since the rise of China and modern day Russia, everything started being about African nations or who African nations wants to side with. So let's get into detail about BRICS. 
One of the least known informations about BRICS countries is that the chairmanship of the group is rotated annually amongst the members in accordance to the acronym BRICS. This year, our country's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, is the chairman of BRICS, hence why he recently went to France as a representative of both Africa and BRICS as well. In 2022, it was China's President Xi Jinping who was in charge. BRICS is basically influential emerging economies that are collaborating to restructure the global economic order to make it fair and inclusive. This is why President Ramaphosa was saying that northern nations didn't treat African nations in a fair manner during the vaccine distribution and vaccine production, stating that these nations were working alongside big pharmaceutical companies for monetary gain through creating a monopoly of the vaccines. Even though when it comes to funding as well, it's said that African nations and South American nations are not treated like European nations when it comes to seeking funds. This flawed global system is why nations are flocking towards BRICS and they are all seeking to join because they see BRICS is doing the opposite by creating a fair system where every member is treated equally by the new development bank and bigger nations like China investing more money in the bank at the beginning.